Morning. Welcome to our first panel at Deal Seat Asia's Private Equity Venture Capital Summit, where we're going to be talking about the L, uh, evolving LPGP dynamics, uh, private market opportunities, and also Asian co-investments. Uh, joining me for this session are Jia Gong, uh, partner Pantian, and Myron Chu, head of private markets, uh, Asia at Manulife Investment Management. Uh, Giacon is, is, has been a partner at Pantheon and she's a member of the firm's Asian uh, Asia Regional Investment Committee and also its global uh, co-investment committee. And among the things that we're going to be asking her today is also her views on the ongoing scrutiny across uh, technology sector in China. For Myron, who leads, who leads uh, Manulife Investment Manager, Management's private ma market uh, business in Hong Kong, he is uniquely placed to highlight third party management of Asian co investments and how Canada's largest insurer is broadening its offerings as it builds out its private equity, private credit, and real estate teams, uh, and also allowing other investors to participate. Uh, thank you, both of you, for joining us for the opening panel. And I would like to start with a big picture question uh, to both of you. Uh, which is that if you sort of look around uh, geopolitics and some of the regulatory developments in China uh, with the crackdown on some sectors, so whether one is an LP or a GP or a private market investor, these I'm assuming are the top issues on one's mind and they should be sort of impacting uh, all decisions. So how do both of you see uh, both geopolitics and the uh, regulatory situation in China currently? Well, that's a very big question, indeed, very big picture. So I think uh, the regulation has been uh, a very big topic recently. But for China Watcher, who have been active in the market for the last 20 years, you do see episodically uh, regulation in various industries um, change or tighten up or there's paradigm shift. Um, and what has recently happened fits into that pattern of uh, cycles of regulation targeting different industries. I think if you synthesize them, there's the theme uh, of the government trying to use its role to, to rein in behavior that may have uh, caused excesses, have negative, sometimes unintended social, social effect, um, and also overall foster competition and take out the uh, I would say unproductive or unnecessary capacity. Um, when I look back the last uh, 14 years when I was in Asia, you know, I've seen the, the, the dealing with the mine over capacity, I've seen the supply chain reform. Uh, more recently, I've seen in the healthcare arena, the, um, the, the collective uh, bargaining of volume-based purchases all those things point to that overarching thought process I talked about earlier. So specifically on this regulation, if you actually look at the various pieces of, uh, uh, of uh, events, you will see the commonality <coughs> is a heightened sense of S, of ESG. What I mean is that uh, there is a very you know, amplified social lens in which government look at competition within the very large platforms that have uh, garnered a lot of power through the, the wealth of data it collects. Um, there are some practices that in any country's books would be considered monopolistic behavior uh, that is uh, used to, in a way, arrest competition. And that there are other sectors which are benign to start with through the amplification of capital uh, has really permeated into middle uh, class people's lives that take away their disposable income as well as leisure, um, having the unintended consequence of discouraging women from having more children. So a lot of these things uh, were not dealt with, but uh, regulation always lags in uh, innovation, but there's always a time for them to catch up. The question is really, uh, you know, let's just hope um, that the overshooting effect is not excessive, discouraging entrepreneurial spirit and discouraging startup uh, fervor. We can certainly talk more about that later. Yes, we'll come back to that. Uh, very uh, lots to address specifically to that. We'll come back to this later. But uh, uh, Maron, big picture, what do you think? Sure, I think uh, Jay has covered this quite well. 
from the overall rationale behind what the recent government policy changes are. But frankly, you know, if you have monitored China closely enough uh, for the last decades or two, China is always a policy-driven market. And uh, also, government tends to be quite open and transparent with their intention. And a lot of these policy changes has been hinted as a major concerns in the last a year or two, maybe even three, four years ago. Uh, it just recently when they put into action the way they implemented, uh, it could be a little bit more disruptive. But as a large country, um, uh, there are certain ways to be better, to be communicated and implement this. But I think what has caught the capital markets in general a surprise is just the, uh, the, the pace as well as the frequency of this policy change in one go, right? Um, but the reality is, um, for us, we are not really surprised with what these things have been coming up. We're only surprised by the really the intensity of this happen in a short period of time. And the other part in terms of, you know, does that really impact our investment decision? Um, as you mentioned in your question, the reality is I would say probably not because when we look into investing in Asia or specific China, uh, for private markets, we are long-term investors. So you always watch out for potential signals way ahead of time because we're not public market investors. We cannot go in and out market at the flip of the keyboard. And uh, so a lot of these so-called telltales, the signs, is in the market a long time ago, right? So you, you try to understand what the risk, what the headwinds are, and also always be very um, sensitive towards what the potential policies are going to be impacted or what the new policy might be coming, uh, the government are thinking. So if you put yourself into government shoes to understand what the rationale, what the key drivers behind what they try to achieve, a lot of these things can be preemptively uh, anticipated or addressed in my view, right? So at the end of the day, um, our investment philosophy it still remains the same and also our partnership approach still remains the same. If you are um, doing the deals and making investment with the right partners, with the local expertise, normally they tend to be well positioned to anticipate this change way ahead of the market. Interesting, yeah. A uh, good set of opening comments to start with. I just want to step back a, a bit. Um, let me again uh, come back to you, uh, Jia, from uh, an LP perspective. China was the first to sort of emerge from the pandemic. Uh, did you make any changes to your investment thesis for the post pandemic world? Well, I think the pandemic is like a heart attack people wake up and then people start to check the overall resilience of the, 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 the system, the body system. Uh, the area the focus is naturally are, you know, is every link of the chain on the supply chain side, distributor side, manufacturing side, all robust. Um, and also balance sheet, is that strong enough to weather the dry patches if there's prolonged dis disruption? Um, I think fortunately, not necessarily by any foresight. Um, the Asian PE generally score pretty high in resilience because there's so much market opportunity in um, that has the technology overlay, and that also is in the healthcare area. And those are the those are the two net beneficiaries of the COVID. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say people double down on those sectors afterwards. Uh, because from a relative value point of view, those two sectors have bec both become a lot more expensive. You know, barring the last several months because of regulatory development, etc., there's certain um, capital leaving those spaces and the valuation have come down a bit. Um, but I think by and large, um, those examinations have proven that not necessarily through through, through foresight, um, the PE positioning in those sector exposures have been very, very, uh, very good from a resilience point of view. And Asia, as you know, doesn't have too much leverage uh, compared with the US and European PE market. So that also stands companies in good stead to be able to weather the storm much better. Got it. Uh, Maran, let me come to you. When it, uh, if you look at historically, uh, Manila's private market exposure in Asia uh, has been low. How has that been changing? And also, why now? 
and within asia pacific which are the markets that you are sort of increasing your allocations to or are the most uh, bullish on and has the pandemic resulted in any changes for you overall in your investment thesis um, maybe I correct one thing. Um, the manual light private market exposure in Asia from a relative basis may be low, but absolute dollar amount actually is not small. Um, as you went introduced manual life um, as the largest Canadian insurance company, which is true. But if you really look at holistic of our business as of today, it's really a global business. Um, Asia accounts for about close to a little bit over one third of the global business. And the North America actually about equally split between Canada and the U.S. And the meanwhile, Asia is the fastest growing business for manual life as a whole. So I wouldn't be surprised in the next few years, Asia accounts for 40 percent, if not more, of the global business because we are accounting for over 70, 80 percent of the annual growth right now. Um, but from a private market perspective, yes, we uh, historically because we are very North America centric and we have a well established platform there. Uh, currently, globally, we manage about 100 billion uh, AUM for private markets assets out of over 1 trillion AUM, uh, the total AUM that we are overseeing. Um, but Asia, uh, it accounts for less than 10 percent. If you look at the overall business, as I mentioned earlier, both on the top line and the bottom line, Asia accounts for one third and close to 40 percent. So from that perspective, on a relative basis, Asia is uh, under allocated. Yes. And, um, but nonetheless, I think, you know, one of the things that's exactly what I've been tasked to do to build the private market business for many lives, because our Asia, uh, AUM is growing, um, given the overall uh, very favorable demographics in Asia. We are in about 11, 12 different markets in Asia, and we've been here for more than 120 years. Um, so with that said, uh, it's a top priority from many life perspective, what we call a must win battle internally is really to build the Asia asset management business, especially related to private markets. Um, so that's why I'm very excited to be here um, and to try to build a business accordingly. And um, in terms of the overall Asia uh, markets, uh, which markets the allocation um, you're asking for, uh, I think it's also ties to our overall business needs. Uh, if you look at our overall business uh, for Asia, you know, we are largest in Hong Kong, you know, not only in terms of insurance, we are currently already number one in MPF um, um, uh, segments in Hong Kong as well. And then second, we are also big in China. We have a JV, couple of JVs in China, both in the asset management as well as the life coast side. And then Japan, Singapore, and plus a few other regional markets as well. So um, the way we look at things is very simple, right? It, in a way, it ties to the global investors. If you look at the, a, the liability side, is really where our insurance premium come in. And then on the uh, investment side, it's uh, somewhat independent, but obviously if there are synergy we can strive between the uh, investment with our liability book, you know, that's always uh, is better, especially we don't need to worry about additional FX hedging, which tends to be, could be some of 200 basis point saving for us from that perspective. Um, so um, we have been deploying capital as well as investing in the market really largely depends on our current life course needs are but for private markets we also try to build a third-party business and on that is really going to be dependent based on what the investors preference as well as what opportunities allocated at, at any given point so whether the pandemic has resulted in any change to our investment thesis i think um i would say not really in big big semantic views um there's a number of things we can talk about very favorably about Asia, despite the pandemic, right? China is the first coming back, and uh, the demographics is much younger, and the wealth creation, if you look at all the, where the new money coming, I get, you know, there's a self-party research report comments, over 50% of the new capital coming to private markets is coming from Asia, compared to historical. And, um, but however, there are some fine tuning in some of the sub-segments. Um, especially in light of some of the uh, current geopolitical as well as um, the, uh, the policy changes largely is, has been anticipated to some extent. But however, I would say a few bright spots which we have been always forefront and focused on is ESG, you know, the net zero, the renewable. Uh, we still like long duration assets such as real estate infrastructure, but within infrastructure, we like the digital infrastructure. 
and as one private credit. So that's a long yeah. answer to your question. But, yeah. You know. I'm, yes. Thank you. I'm going to come back to some of those points uh, later. Uh, Jay, let me just uh, moving beyond the pandemic. Uh, uh, I'm just going to ask you again, uh, more of a big picture question, because capital is a commodity today. And how has the opportunity set therefore been impacted by ample liquidity uh, and increased market um, competition? Yeah, um, I would say that um, capital is a commodity, but uh, from a, well, I would say the distribution of that capital supply is very different in different parts of the market. Um, you know, there are certain sectors that uh, have uh, attracted a lot of capital, but it doesn't mean that every sector fares just as well. So there's always this uh, sector rotation if you watch the public list of the space, uh, and that sector rotation changes quite a bit, as uh, you would have seen those colored heat maps from investment banking researchers. Today's hot sector doesn't mean it's going to last tomorrow. And the relative value is therefore something a lot of people are watching out for when they manage a portfolio. I would say the same applies in PE. Uh, there are certain sectors through the, when the stars are aligned, you know, the right uh, fundamentals plus the right technology productivity gain plus the right policy tailwind just foster a, a fantastic uh, investment case and a lot of money swamp paying valuation gets untenable and then there is some pulling back there's so the last people going in may not make any money um, there's always that dynamic working out i would say overall asia is not as abundantly supplied with capital pe capital as the us um, i'm always amazed at uh, the amount of secondary buyouts that i see um, in, in western europe and in the us in the Asian markets, the developed Asian markets, when you look at Japan, Korea, Australia, um, there, you know, the percentages of secondary buyout or even tertiary buyout is much less. And that to you, uh, to me, is an indication that the competition, while it's certainly intense, is not quite there uh, when it comes to money chasing a lot of deals. And I think with the recent re regulatory development, um, you know, I think there was a point where there's a little bit of market uh, policy fatigue. I saw, I came across a phrase saying, sell first, then evaluate. You know, we passed that point. Uh, that was uh, probably four weeks ago, five weeks ago, when people were a little bit dumbfounded at the frequency and uh, intensity, uh, intensity of the uh, different kind of uh, uh, regulatory uh, developments. Uh, so that actually takes some uh, heat, takes a lot of heat off of uh, the, the large platforms. But one thing to differentiate, it's the large platforms that the government uh, have been going after because those exercises excessive power in their market influence, um, in their ability to, to really um, stymie the, the, the smaller players, either by buying them or by making them less competitive. So in a way, this clean up, just like any anti-competition is intended, uh, gives a more level playing field for the smaller competitors. Um, so, you know, in a way, our venture capital GPs, they are not too bent out of shape. Uh, actually, some think this is actually pretty good because there's a, a better chance for their companies to, 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 to not to be squeezed very hard. Um, what also takes a page from the Chebu uh, phenomenon in Korea, which is perennially their number one, number two election, <laughs> top of the agenda item. You don't want your economy to be so concentrated in, you know, 20 or, or 40 top or family owned conglomerates. So what is done here, while it's ferocious and certainly destroyed a lot of uh, capital from a public market point of view, is unfortunately necessary at some point there needs to be this reckoning and uh, you know, the sooner it happens, the less fallout there is. But of course, when those things happen, the shareholders for those big platforms, uh, uh, you know, take a thump. But uh, to the broader society, people see the logic, see the rationale, are able to wrap their their minds around that. Yeah, since you spoke about the you know the large internet platforms and how the regulatory situation in China is sort of largely targeted at these entities, just a quick related question. 
does that mean for both P and VC investors, it opens up a lot more opportunities in terms of smaller companies, mid-sized companies to look at? Mm, I think it's a tricky one. Um, I think um, the entrepreneurial spirit is always very, very strong. So even when those big guys are there, you know, initially I just thought, okay, e-commerce, end of story, there's Alibaba, there's JD, there's no more innovation permissible. But there have been a whole crop of, uh, you know, e-commerce, social e-commerce and so forth. Um, my imagination couldn't stretch far enough for these things. Um, but I think uh, it comes to a point where those bigger players certainly have very, very uh, outsized advantages when it comes to competition because they have the, the traffic uh, in their hands. Um, how the smaller competitions will, uh, the, 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 the smaller players will benefit from this, I think it's a little early to tell. Uh, but we certainly see when there are fights between those big guys entering to some adjacent areas, knocking the incumbents off their seats. There's recent some, uh, some I would say, mellowing uh, or some uh, slowdown in that competitive behavior, in sort of burning and slash kind of behavior. And that overall is good. You know, we all have that picture of mountains on mountains of the jumped bikes at the roadside, and that's a horrible waste ecologically, environmentally, uh, and, and socially as well. So that's frankly a direct competition of just capital field, um, price, brutal price cut battles that ultimately benefits nobody. Um, those are the lessons that should be avoided and should be avoided uh, through government competition because left on its own device, the, the market is going to have that playbook played out in other sectors too. Got it. Uh, Martin, let me come to you because your approach is very different as a firm. You evaluate potential GPs to partner with and then sometimes you end up picking up a stake with a part to control in the GP and then you also back them as the anchoring LP um, in their new fund. So when you look at a GP, uh, what is it that you're looking for? Is it uh, sector experience? Is it value add capabilities or is it geographical expertise? Or are you looking at co-investments, first time managers? What exactly do you look for? Uh, can I say all the above and more? Um, and it's, you know, I was joking internally, it's like a dating process. You know, you try to find the right partners and then um, back with all your resources behind the partners and looking for the synergy and grow the business together. So that's what we do. Um, so in a way, yes, we are looking for a leading team has proven track record and the differential strategy, local expertise, and also a strategy which can potentially can scale. Um, then from many life perspective, we are a large institution. So what we're looking to do is we really want to add the bells whistles behind the team, not so much about on the investment side, because if we partner with the team, we normally will have the conviction that the team know what they do on the investment side, right? We might take a seat on the investment committee, but we certainly do not want to have veto rights. I want the team has full ownership of their investment track record. But what we are doing is we really want to um, provide us institutional level support from ESG, from the risk management, uh, from regulatory compliance oversight and et cetera, and also align our interest together with the, the team as well as together with us as party investors because we put our own money there and we provide so-called the ring fence of the team on the uh, make it as institutionalized as we can. And um, so whoever coming to invest with us don't need to worry about. So we provide additional layer fall back in a way to LPs with the institutionalization approach. Got it. Uh, just two related points here, uh, Jia, in terms of um, uh, GP evaluation, especially first-time managers and uh, spin-out. Uh, anecdotally, from what we hear, it's become a lot more tougher for many of the first-time managers in the you know during the pandemic and even in the post-pandemic space. So, how do you sort of how can they differentiate to attract LP interest? That's one. And as an LP, what have you done in terms of have you added? new matrices when uh, to evaluation playbook when you look at gps well first time managers if they are um 
if they didn't have a previous network of LPs in their prior firm, etc., there, there isn't a pre-existing relationship, then I think uh, indeed it's extremely tough to raise capital um, because I think uh, it's a people business. Uh, when I, what I mean is less about, you know, you need to be friend with anybody, but more about a level of trust to which uh, they can entrust their capital to you because some of you, some of them are also fiduciaries like, like we. So in a way, if there's no prior relationship, to, then to try to build that kind of uh, trust during on, on Zoom is, is very, very hard. Uh, it requires repetition. I also think, uh, you know, there are lots of choices in the market. So the LPs ask, okay, is this a replacement? Is this highly additive and very differentiated from my existing exposure that this is a must have? So new, new GPs need to put themselves in the shoes of the LPs and think, how am I additive to their existing portfolio? Because I think by and large at this point, most of the LPs in the market are already quite established when it comes to their baseline exposure. So anything is either a replacement or a, by exception only um, addition. And uh, when they measure themselves against those kind of a thought process or criteria, then it can help them guide their uh, go-to-market strategy. Got it. Just want to take this um, conversation forward. Uh, one of the big things that everybody is looking today is uh, value add being the key to generating alpha, whether you're whether it's from GPs, whether it's from LPs, uh, private market investors, uh, everybody sort of needs to retool their capability. So, Maren, let me come to you. As a private market investor, what are some of the steps, if any, that you have taken, especially related to China, uh, to increase um, returns? Uh, definitely, like investors' capability to navigate policy changes uh, is, is, is among the big steps that can put them ahead. And while everyone is retooling their capabilities, what has not what has changed and not changed post COVID? Um, sure, I think that, that also ties to back how we look at the uh, the GP evaluation, the partnership evaluation, in that perspective. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, the private market is, is very much a liquid assets, and uh, we need to look at uh, with a long term horizon uh, in terms of what project the future five to seven years where these assets will perform. And what's the headwind, what's the tail end wing, how we can navigate that. So on the transaction level, obviously with the recent policy changes, there are uh, increasing people asking for, okay, can we price these assets according to the additional renewed heightened um, concern on the policy risk? And also can we structure these uh, transactions by offload? Is a, completed or partially some of these risks to the local partners, right? So these are the really on the nitty gritty side, what people try to think about freshly, how we look at these risks. And um, frankly, this is nothing new and it should be always in the playbook. I don't think this is something that, you know, it just coming because of the policy change, but obviously policy change is just heightened the concerns on these issues. Um, so why we're not changing the investment philosophy, the approach, and et cetera? But I would say um, there are a few, uh, from a practical perspective, there are some technical changes. Um, as Jay mentioned, you know, since we had been locked down, <laughs> not traveling for quite some time, and when you, I need to cover the pan Asia market, uh, without being able to see team and to spend time with the team face to face, it's difficult, right? The Zoom call, um, you know, tends to be, it's very task driven. It does not give you the time to get to know each other as a person. And uh, that becomes less efficient. Also, we are start adopting what we call remote due diligence process. But the remote due diligence process, it engage a third party consultant to help you. That will mitigate certain things. We, we can still strive to do deals, but nonetheless, it's still not perfect compared to you be able to physically on the ground personally get building relationship, kick the tie, you know, see firsthand what's going on, right? Um, so these are the things actually is a challenge we're facing, but we are making adjustment post COVID. Got it. Uh, 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 Jill, let me come to you here. 
Yeah, one thing to add is, uh, broadly speaking, among the LPs, we have seen reference calls becoming a lot more frequent, both outreaching ones that I do when I diligence managers, as well as in inbound ones. Reference calls are becoming a, a, a very, very big tool, more than pre-COVID, because there's less personal contact. There's more about just using one's own network to gather intelligence on a purely confidential basis about a specific GP, you know, portfolio, specific portfolio companies, or, you know, just market reputation and so forth. So that's not quite the replacement for personal contact, that familiarity that Myron talked about, but uh, it goes some way to mitigate, you know, certain unknown unknowns that we are all worried about. Got it. But, uh... But for GPs, when it comes to value add, it also depends on the strength of the team. So what do you think firms need to do to get the best operating teams on board? Oh, I think uh, sector knowledge is the, the, in a way, that's the origin of all value add. Because with the knowledge of a given sector, then you understand where the pain points are, what the common struggles are. You also know where the talents are to unlock those problems. Um, so the, the, the knowledge of a certain space and the inside viewpoint uh, allows you to do all sorts of things, whether it's to build a relationship with an entrepreneur, tell him what he might not be able to see. You know, entrepreneurs uh, could, knows a lot about his business, but he may have some blinkers on when it comes to his competitor's business or when it comes to similar industries in, in other markets. Those are all knowledges that a GP can bring to the entrepreneur to demonstrate that he can be the extended eye and ear, um, not just on the ground, but also in, in overseas context, etc. With that knowledge, one would also naturally have a network of uh, talents, um, advisors and uh, customers, etc. So, so it really opens up the potential to add a lot of value. It's not necessarily just an operating partner kind of format where you have one gray haired guy, uh, a veteran of a given industry, you parachute him in as chairman of the board or as a functional specialist. Um, that's a lot of the, the playbook by journalists. But I think uh, given the proliferation of specialization these days in PE and in VC, we see a much more intimate kind of uh, interaction, much more hands-on in a way where the GP themselves know a lot about the industry and know a lot about who is who in the industry. So they're able to decipher opportunities much better and uh, avoid some obvious pitfalls. And they're also able to strike a deeper relationship with the entrepreneur as a go-to person when it comes to key strategies. Um, so that will be an ideal situation rather than relying on a bench of external advisors. Got it. As we come to the last 10 minutes, I want to shift focus a bit, go back to the tech and regulatory developments and also, you know, maybe look at exits quickly. Uh, so again, um, in terms of the current, uh, we spoke about it earlier, but in terms of the current uh, regulatory changes uh, in China, especially in the tech space, uh, I would like both of you to sort of uh, give your views on how do you see this play out in the next one or two years? I wish I had that crystal ball. I don't. <laughs> Look, I, I, I think I scratched my head thinking, okay, well, you know, from a regulatory point of view, um, it's hard to, to, to really predict what's going to happen. But I, I feel what has taken place probably represents the major thrusts of uh, of uh, the, the stopping of wild, wild west, maverick kind of uh, industry condition that has prevailed in VC for such a long time. Um, and uh, there speculation on what's next. Some people say healthcare, but hey, actually, for those who really watch healthcare, regulatory changes has not stopped for the last several years. Some are really good, like the, the joining of uh, China into international clinical data sharing, um, the the labeling or, or the tying of uh, manufacturing uh, or, or the detachment of manufacturing from the intellectual property ownership, all those are really, really good regulatory moves. And there are others, depending on which side you're on, you can either be a loser or a winner. 
for example, the, the, the raising of the clinical uh, regulatory uh, trial standards of uh, so-called new drugs, it has to be significantly meet better rather than just me too with a tiny little tweak, as well as the, the, the volume-based um, collective purchase that I talked about earlier that has serious consequence on, on unit price, but a much I think the exchange of big volume. So all those things have already happened. A uh, long story of saying that, you know, there are certainly, you know, other regulations that can come on stream, but I feel my personal feeling is that the, 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 the big thrust of it is behind us. Um, so the question really is, uh, you know, those hard tech, core tech, um, things that to do with advanced uh, manufacturing process, robotics, etc. How do they land? What kind of commercial applications can they find themselves uh, in all sorts of uh, you know usage scenarios, and uh, how those opportunities can blossom into revenues? Uh, it's uh, it's in a way more on the technologies side to see how opportunity how technologies are in a way commercialized and the market uh, adoption of those. Myra? Yeah, no, I think um, I can share the, the, I would say maybe either frustration or the uh, uh, the potential uh, magic ball that uh, Jay tried to have in terms of identify what are the future winners in these uh, new venture deals. Uh, from our end, actually, we take a slightly different approach because a few semantic direction is very clear. Right, digitalization, especially with COVID, just look at the amount of the, the Zoom calls we do, all the data. So we tend to invest in the backbone infrastructure, we call it digital infrastructure, because the usage of that, irrespective of which new business model will come up, irrespective of which uh, new um, venture will become another unicorn. I think this is inevitable trend. Um, so from a, a uh, investment perspective, we really like the, uh, the digital data center. So we are very keen in the data center sectors, uh, data securities, etc. And also we want another big thing we like is about we call the energy transition. Energy itself is a big industry, right? Bigger than anyone you can imagine. Uh, with the improving technology, with the batteries, uh, the latest battery technologies, and with the requirement for the renewable and the net zero. Uh, the overall energy sector is going through a profound uh, transition. Um, so there's a number of things you can do within the energy sector um, through the technology enabled, through the new renewable the efficiency, etc. So that part of the business sector, we are very keen to participate. So do you therefore see increased allocation to infrastructure, renewables, private credit? Uh, you know, these are long duration asset heavy structures. Um, well, that's a, there's a big um, synergy between what our own capital requirements are, right? There are a number of global large institution investors um, look at it from a portfolio construction perspective. The venture normally is a small percentage of uh, the overall portfolio because just uh, it's a hit and a miss scenario, right? You know, it's, it's a great story to tell if you get into Uber in the first round, if you get into Ali in early rounds, um, but uh, from an overall portfolio return perspective, especially with large institutional investors, um, the major allocation still go to the cash generating hard assets from a risk adjust basis. So that's really, you know, the DNA for manual life as well. We have a big balance sheet book um, and we're looking for investments. You know, we are looking for a predictable return with a very uh, low downside and uh, we, we like the asset backed uh, uh, assets in general. Got it. Uh, Jia, when it comes to tech, what are the uh, overlooked verticals uh, where in the current scenario there may be great opportunities? That's one. And a second um, question that I wanted to ask you is, there was a time when everybody was forced to rush into tech. Uh, in the current scenario, do you therefore see more diversification? Yeah, maybe I'll tackle the second question first. Look, I, I don't necessarily think it's a... It's a you know, tech itself is not a um, isolated silo. Uh, technology is applied everywhere. 
um, that without technology, the companies run the risk of being left behind. So you, you wouldn't necessarily categorize all your companies' exposures in, into technology. Uh, but tech here, maybe in the more narrow sense or more traditional sense, really refers to um, early-ish stage venture businesses. You know, for example, I make a distinction in your earlier question. You say, will there be a lot of money going into the renewables, going into uh, those areas? That's infrastructure with very different risk reward. If you if you are interested in investing in battery, uh, in battery storage technology, that's venture investing. It's not infrastructure investing. But that could very well apply in your future infrastructure, let's say smart city infrastructure investing. But that investment will have a very different risk reward. Technology will be super proven, operational, mature, and you will still have the contractual or GDP related um, revenue stream that's highly predictable. So I think we're talking about two, 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 two schools here, but the parallel is, you know, those future proof infrastructure, is that technology? No, that's not technology. So I, I would just to make a, a distinction here. There's, there's investment that's future proof from a technology sustainability uh, point of view um, that are just not technology investment, but they're certainly tech enabled and they're they're advanced. So they they sit well from a technology replacement obsolescent point of view. Yeah, and overlooked verticals. Which do you think they are? Well, a uh, very tough question. I think uh, you know things to do with uh, storage, battery storage, like what Myron's talked about. Um, that's going to be very exciting. Things to do with automation. Things every opportunity that's brought on by the prevalence of five G. There, there are lots of applications there. All those will be pretty exciting. What's hard to predict is exactly to what I pointed earlier. It's at this point very hard to tell. You know, it's only with those uh, people with great technology foresight can tell where are we in the adoption curve that certain products will fly off the shelf uh, if a tech if there's the right alignment between technology usage and the the un unmet needs or even undetected needs. Um, and uh, those are, frankly, why the venture capitals are what they are in, in, in their prediction. Anything that uh, we can see as an LP have already been in the portfolio and therefore, by definition, already, already not something that may happen in the, in the next several years. I know this is not quite satisfactory in the answer you're looking for, but uh, I think just think along the lines of fundamental science and technology development and that's got to be 5g and think about the whole decarbonization of the world and all the pledges um, countries made on carbon zero and that's got to be electrification of things that's got to be the renewables you know how to store those uh you know leading to battery tech uh, battery storage technology that uh, myron talked about so i think maybe thinking about those fundamentals will help one at least get to the right direction of what technologies will become the next, uh, in a way, you know, um, the next uh, Midas moment uh, for, 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 for opportunities to become uh, desicorns. Yeah. Oh, got it. We're out of time, but I just want you both, both our panelists to take a minute each on exits. Where do you see uh, exits? And Myron, uh, specifically uh, for you, I just wanted to ask you, like, how do you see with with um, the traditional IPOs? Uh, a lot of Chinese companies were looking for listing in the U.S., and now that's sort of come to a halt. So, what can China do to sort of uh, make it a preferred destination for local companies to list and provide exits? Well, I think the government has been doing this for some time already. They went through various experiments, you know, with uh, the uh, the various new technology board or the new boards try to try it out, um, and they also try to experiment the uh, registration instead of approval process. Um, but it's still a relative early days. Um, I think you know, it takes time for any exchange to be mature to be well recognized. 
and be able to develop the mechanism that uh, reasonably uh, transparent and safe for investors to participate. So I think uh, from the, uh, the development uh, phase or uh, level perspective, there's still a long way for China to go. Um, I think Hong Kong is also looking uh, at one point you know, to see whether to try to replicate a NASDAQ board uh, compared to what the US. So I think over time, I expect this to happen. Um, and it just it's a sign of how the market should naturally evolve and develop. Yeah, sure. I agree with uh, Myron. I think there's also talk about uh, Beijing Stock Exchange. So there will be more venues uh, for exits. I also think, uh, you know, uh, over the course, you know, there could be potential solution of uh, um, companies going to the U.S. Um, I think right now the sensitivity are with those that have a lot of uh, over a million uh, customer data. Um, but of course, a lot of uh, that doesn't apply to a lot of the companies. For example, you know, medical device company or drug companies, their clinical trial data is very, very small compared with that threshold. So I think it's it's um, one one shouldn't take a uh, broad brush kind of a approach. Um, certainly, those things windows are sentiment driven, but the reality is that um, there will be ebbs and flows in which time they, they will be open. Ultimately, it's really the fundamentals of the business that attract investors. Investors will hunt those companies down on a relative uh, risk reward basis if they find that there's a uh, compelling enough case to invest in them. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, so much to both our panelists. Unfortunately, we can't uh, take more questions. Um, great to have both of you. Uh, uh, Jia Myron, thank you for joining us. Uh, great session. I enjoyed the conversation uh, with you, and I'm sure our audience uh, did too. Thank you. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you.